Any education apart from Jesus Christ is for us miseducation. And it produces not education nor an educated man, but a new race of barbarians who are today busily destroying their civilization. Humanistic education is the institutionalized love of death. Christian education, because it serves him who says, I am the way, the truth, and the light, is the love of life. This is the Love of Life Podcast, Conversations with Jesse and Courtney. Welcome to another episode of the Love of Life Podcast. Uh, well, here we are again. It's uh, episode 14. Thank you for joining us. Today, we have a special guest with us. We have Nathan Anderson. He's the director of On Earth As It Is In Heaven and the upcoming docu-series, Teach All Nations. He's coming to us from Chile right now, and he's been gracious enough to set aside a few minutes to talk about his documentary, Post-Millennialism, and maybe anything else that we can think to ask him. So let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, Nathan. Yeah, thanks for having me. This, this is great. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, your documentary is phenomenal. I was telling Courtney, we were just kind of relaying, remembering how we found it. I was, one night I was on Amazon and I clicked, I just typed in post-millennialism and your documentary was on the top search result. And I said, oh, I'll just turn it on. You know, I didn't know who you were. And about halfway through, I see Doug Wilson. I'm like, oh, we, we know him, um, which was really exciting. And then it was, it is really, it's really good. And that's an understatement. It's a really good documentary. How many times have you seen it? Far too many. <laughs> it's, it's so compact. You, you have so yeah. much in it that I have seen it um, half a dozen times. Probably, At least. probably. Yeah. Wow. We'll just go with half a dozen. Awesome. <laughs> And recommending it to anyone who will who will listen. It's a lot of good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, some people some people think it's a little too long. Some people think it's too short, but or you know, it's it's always hard to have a balance with that. It is, and it's such a big subject. Um, you know, and it's it's what two and a half hours long, I think. It's two hours long. Two hours. Okay. About I think it's just around two hours. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't seem too long to me at all. It just was, we needed to watch it again, (laughs) just because there was so much that, you know, you might miss in that first go around because it's so content heavy, but that was great Mm -hmm. about it. And then there it is all recorded. So you can watch it again. And if you're him again and again and again and again. Okay. 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 So, (laughs) so, but to get started, can you give us just like a brief definition of what is eschatology? Well, eschatology is the study of last things. So, the, so eschatos is the, the Greek word for, for last, you know, and so it's a study of last things. And it involves, on the one hand, uh, the issue of, you know, heaven and hell, uh, the eternal destiny of, of human beings and, and those kinds of questions. But it also uh, deals with the the subject of the 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 latter days or the the final days um before the coming of christ uh, before the second coming of christ and what exactly that is going to entail what that's going to look like especially what do the scriptures teach from a christian perspective obviously because there's other eschatologies and everybody has an eschatology in one way or another, but um, uh, from a Christian perspective, it has to do with what does the scripture teach about uh, the, the, the latter days and what does the scripture teach about the time, what the world and the church and everything is going to look like uh, when Christ returns, basically. Yep. Yep. So, so I that guess the kind of a brief definition of eschatology, at least the, the, the word. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so give us, I guess, a, a, a brief definition of post-millennial eschatology. We don't have to go through each of the different frameworks, but post-mill eschatology seems to, um, it's not the one talked about primarily in 
this day and age right now, as much as it is maybe the dispensational premillennialism eschatology or amillennial, but it, I also think that it's making a comeback. But anyway, give us a definition of post-mill eschatology, if you will. Yeah, so, well, you know, to, just to kind of introduce that, I mean, all the names of these positions all relate to, you know, have to do with millennium, you know, and so you have post-millennialism, amillennialism, pre-millennialism, and the millennium is basically uh, something that appears in Revelation 20, where, uh, you know, uh, uh, John sees a vision, right, of an angel, you know, coming down and and, 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 you know, chaining the devil and putting him in a bottomless pit and uh, Christ reigning with his saints for a thousand years. And so um, that's the millennium. And people obviously uh, are trying to understand what exactly that is talking about, um, come to different conclusions. And so you have all millennialism, which literally means no millennium in that sense. Um, but basically the amillennialists believe that it's that millennium is the time between the first and second coming of Christ. Then premillennialism is that Christ is going to come back and then inaugurate this millennial kingdom that's going to last a thousand years and of Christ reigning on earth physically. And then there's postmillennialism, which, you know, actually understands it, um, it, it in different ways. I mean, the the earlier post-millennialists, for the most part, not all, but for the most part, um, understood uh, th this as a future thousand years, um, not, of, not of Christ's return, but actually before Christ's return. That's where you get the term post-millennialism. So Christ is coming back after the millennium in that sense. And, and that, th that future extended period of time is going to be, you know, Christ's glory uh, or of the church, basically, um, you know, being successful and discipling the nations and Christianizing the world and all the nations coming under uh, the banner of, of, of Christ, basically. And, um, um, and so, you know, modern post-millennialists, maybe you take a more of an amillennial kind of a understanding of of the particular passage, right? But they still have that same expectation that the kingdom of God will grow in the world and that in the future, uh, you know, the, all the nations will be Christian. And, and, and yeah, the, 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 the knowledge of the Lord, you know, will fill the earth like the waters cover the sea, you know, as it says in Isaiah 11 and elsewhere. And so, you know, that the, I would say, you know, uh, Pastor Douglas Wil Wilson said before that he thinks that post-millennialism isn't, and actually all the millennial kind of, you know, uh, titles or, or, or of, of the positions aren't all that helpful because we're talking about one particular passage. And he, he says that post-millennialism probably uh, would be better called uh, historical optimism. Right. And so so the idea that the church will be successful in history before Christ returns, because all the other positions and this is the distinctive aspect, all the other positions ultimately have to say in one way or another, you know, there's differences between free mail and all mail. But in the end, they both say, yeah, in the current, you know, at this current time, uh, you know, that the church is not going to be successful uh, in the nations, in the sense that it's not going to disciple actual nations. It's just going to be a witness in the nations, you know, and, and so um, there's no actual goal of discipling any particular nation. You know, that's, there, there's not that end goal. It's simply be a presence in one way or another. So I even heard there was a pastor the other day that was, you know, explaining the position and he said, yeah, I mean, North Korea is a discipled nation, you know, because there are Christians in North Korea, you know, and, and, um, uh, and so that's that basically. And so um, that, but post-millennialism actually believes that, no, there's actually a, a goal, you know, we're actually working towards something that has not been accomplished completely yet that is being worked out in history, you know, I mean, it, it was accomplished in one sense with the, uh, you know, with the, obviously the resurrection of Christ, you know, from the dead and his ascension and him being crowned. Uh, but 
that that victory is still working itself out in history until every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, right? And so there's a process uh, that we, you know, as, as God's children and as his people have the privilege of taking part in, being a part of that. You know, God is using his church to, to bring about the obedience of the nations as, you know, that's what Paul, that's the way Paul described the mission, his mission, at least Paul's mission when in Romans at the beginning and at the end of the book of Romans, Paul says that his, he summarized his mission as, as, as calling the nations to, to obey, you know, Mm -hmm. basically. And so that, that's in a, in a brief nutshell, kind of what the post-millennial perspective is. It has to do with, with this idea of the nations being discipled, the world being Christianized and, the the in the christian church actually accomplishing the mission that christ gave his church in the great commission yeah that's an excellent synopsis very good but so let's just say now i agree with everything you just said but i you know <laughs> we will have christians uh very well-meaning Christians who know their Bibles who will then say the you know they'll they'll say well that sounds well and good Nathan but Where do you find that specifically in scripture? They'll say things like, you know, Jesus did say to go to teach all nations, but it did it really say that it's going to be successful. And, uh, you know, some people um, you can point to certain passages and they'll see it. And other people, you can point to the same passages and they'll say, no, I I don't see it. So what passages do you specifically look to that says the kingdom will grow, continue to grow? And eventually we will be a one world, we will have a one world religion in essence, and it will be Christianity. Where, where do we see that biblically? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I, you know, I, I asked a similar question to, um, uh, to Dr. Ken Gentry when I was doing the, 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 the you know, sent him the questions for the interviews. And I, I asked him, like, what's the one, you know, if you had one passion to explain post-millennialism, what would it be? And, and he gave an interesting answer. He said, it's not about one passage. You know, post-millennialism is a, a doctrine that we find throughout Scripture. It's the flow of, 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 of the whole story of redemption, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and when people introduce this idea of, of historical pessimism, it's actually counterintuitive to the story of redemption in script that we find in scripture so you know it, it, the, it, as we we see you know abraham right well i mean we go to the the genesis chapter three you know and um uh, and we see the 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 um, the, the proto-evangelium where in, in genesis three fifteen, you know um, God, you know, talks about the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent and this, you know, this battle that will uh, be, you know, that, that will happen between them. And, but that ultimately the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And so we see, you know, we, we begin there and then we go through, uh, you know, Abraham who, uh, you know, his, his promise of a land and it's promised that he's going to have descendants you know like the stars and and like the sand on on the seashore and then you know you go through through redemptive history and you you see the children of israel and ultimately throughout the the old testament prophets this promise and this idea that the israel and is supposed to be a light to the nations and that ultimately what god is doing through israel is gonna change the world and that's where you get all these passages that speak of the age of the Messiah, and they speak of it as a glorious age where, you know, I mean, you go to uh, passages, like I mentioned, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, or you go to Isaiah chapter 2 that speaks, you know, about the the, the mountain, right, of the house of the Lord. It's going to be elevated above all the mountains, right, and all the nations are going to flow to it, and, um, uh, and they're going to be taught the law of God, and ultimately, um, they're going to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning horns, hooks, and um, a nation will not lift up sword against nation. And so you you see these promises of peace, right? Or 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 Isaiah thirty two, or I you know just all the way through Isaiah sixty five. There's so many 
passages uh, to, that speak of the age of the Messiah and what will be accomplished during the age of the Messiah. And so, um, so that I think is very important to, to understand um, when we're considering this, this issue of eschatology is that that's the expectation that goes throughout scripture, basically. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and, and, and so, and that is the flow of the natural flow of the text, you know, even when you get to the, uh, to the new Testament, you, you have this language of, of, you know, you, you have Jesus saying to Peter, right on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not, you know, be able to, to stand against it ultimately. And, and so that is, that, that is what we see throughout scripture. Right. And, and, um, uh, and again, and I think a very important point that is very often overlooked about the um, uh, great commission, especially because yeah, some people say, well, well, a lot of people won't even admit that it's about discipling nations. So they'll say, no, it's just talking about, you know, discipling some people from nations in general, but it's not talking about actually transforming nations. But if people are willing to admit, okay, it is about transforming nations, but it's just not going to be accomplished because Jesus isn't here. Jesus needs to come back so that these things uh, will be accomplished. And, um, uh, and, and then they say something like, well, you, you just think that you're, you know, we're going to accomplish these things in our own strength. And I, I, I kind of challenge people sometimes and say, wait, wait a second. Um, you know, was not the Holy Spirit sent to empower the church? Is not, and this is a very important point, is not the Holy Spirit the third person of the Trinity? What's our Trinitarian doctrine? I mean, it, so, so you're saying to me, we have the Holy Spirit, but we need Jesus to come, we need Jesus to, to, to clean up this mess because, you know, church empowered by the Holy Spirit, that's just not enough. Um you know, I mean, is the Holy Spirit not God? And, and frankly, I think, <clears throat> unfortunately, in our day and age, a lot of people have a very, um, I, I would say, um, um, deficient view of the work of the Holy Spirit and of, you know, he, the fact that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity in that sense. And so if God is with us and God has given us a task why in the world do we think that, you know, we just, it's, it's just, we, we can't do it. You know, it, it won't work. I mean, uh, what else is, is God supposed to give us uh, in that sense? And so that's my, my, my perspective in terms of, of, of that kind of criticism. I, 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 I kind of push back a bit at, uh, when people say something like that and say, well, what, who is the Holy spirit and why would we not be able to accomplish what, Christ has called us to accomplish and who has more than equipped us for that task. The, the, the Holy Spirit is more than enough um, to, to fulfill what, the, the, what Christ has set forth as the commission for his church, ultimately. And so I, I think those are some, some issues that need to be um, considered. And yeah, you mentioned there are texts, you know, that, that people point to that, that speak of of difficult times um, and and, um, uh, and and things of that nature, but I think a lot of times to automatically, um, well, in the first place, to automatically assume that those texts are are talking about the time right before the second coming, I think, is somewhat problematic. And obviously, it's going to depend on the text that we're looking at. Right. Um, it, but yeah. Well, it just yeah. if I may interject, that's exactly I think what a lot of people are stipulating. A lot of well-meaning Christians stipulate that it's been prophesied. If you, if we take the book of Revelation, they'll say, you know, the beast or the beast system or 666, or they'll start interpreting scripture a certain way. And they'll say, look, it isn't that I want this pessimistic outlook to occur. It's that it's prophesied. And I think that's the part where I go, well, if they would just interpret scripture the way scripture, I think, I believe should be interpreted, they wouldn't then see what they're supposedly seeing. A lot of people, I mean, I don't know if you want to touch on it all, the book of Revelation, for instance, which in and of itself is an animal, uh, you know, to just talk about. But um, if you, you know, if you, if you want to hit any of that, you feel free. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think part of the problem, though, with, with a lot of these discussions is that we end up just talking about the book of Revelation or just talking about Matthew 24 
which are very interesting. And there's, you know, there's a lot that can be, be said about them, you know, um, but at the same time, we, we, and this is a very important principle is we need to understand the Bible uh, when we're, we're trying to put things together with scripture, we need to interpret the, the more, um, you know, difficult texts, the darker texts, um, uh, in, in accord with the, with the, what is more apparent and what is clearer in scripture. That's, you know, that's a very uh, basic, you know, principle that we find in the Westminster Confession and a bunch of other places, you know, in terms of, you know, that some, not all scripture is as easy to interpret, basically, you know, there's some passages that are harder to understand than others. And to automatically jump to the, you know, the Revelation 20, as kind of the trump card for everything else, you know, we have this whole story of redemption that from beginning to end is this, you know, this, this um, uh, uh, promise of victory and of this glorious reign of the Messiah. And then we go, oh, no, but we just have these verses over here. So sorry, well, we have to change all of that, you know, to conform to what my particular view of these seven verses over here, basically, or something like that. And so I think that's where I think when if we're doing things that way we're kind of doing it backwards in a lot of ways and that's not to say that we can't have a discussion about relation 20 or or any of these passages you know that's that's great and and you know i mean uh, people like like dr ken gentry and, and who by the way is going to release a uh, a two-part commentary on the book of revelation hopefully not right. too far into the distant future which is going to be i don't know like thousands of pages and wonderful I, and, that's yeah, exciting. it's going to be wonderful. You know, we're, we've, we've all been expected for that for a number of years. Yeah. Um, you know, people like that have done great work on, on this subject. And, and I encourage you know, people to check that out. But to, to not, you know, lose the forest in the trees, basically, you know, um, and, and getting so hung up on Matthew 24 and, and, you know, these particular passages that you miss the whole story. Mm hmm in that sense. And, and for me personally, I think that was something that, that really changed my outlook in terms of a, a of a, um, you know, a, a post-millennial view, because even before, you know, becoming a post-millennial, I had already studied the issue of, of partial preterism and, you know, that, the, that a lot of the book of Revelation and that was actually talking about the, the Jewish war in the first century. And I'd already come to a lot of those conclusions. Mm. Um, and I was an all millennialist at that time, you know, but it was considering other issues that actually led me to, to, to the understand post-millennialism. It wasn't necessarily looking, in fact, my view of the book of revelation from the time I was an all millennialist to now hasn't really changed all that much. You know, there's a few adjustments here and there, but for the most part, it's just about the same. It, it's all these other issues, um, that, you know, have to do that, you know, flow throughout scripture that helped to change my, my personal opinion on, on that subject. Did you start in the dispensational camp and then kind of work your way over or what, how did you start? And you need to ask. A well, I was, you know, I, I tell people, I, you know, I kind of just um, imbibed the view that the people around me had. I had, not, I, I admit it's, I, I, I never really studied dispensationalism um, you know, in any kind of depth, you know, was I, it's not that I had read all these books about dispensationalism or something, but, you know, I'd heard about the rapture and, you know, a lot of people talked about it. So, I, you know, I believed it in that sense. It's in the air, or, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, it's like, we grew up, it was ubiquitous. Everybody talked about yeah. it. Right. Yeah. yeah, no. And, um, uh, I even, I even, uh, remember I had a friend here who was like a hip hop artist and he had a whole song about the rapture and, you know, and, and the whole thing. And, um, and yet I remember also at some point I, I, um, uh, I started reading the left behind books, the oh. Tim LaHaye. I don't remember which book I got to. I think I got to the one, but it's the one about revelation chapter nine, where there's all the, you know, the, um, the legs and stuff. Hornet. Yeah, we're the, the 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 locust, you know, uh -huh. and all that. Yeah. So I, I got to that point. I don't remember what the book's called, but that's as far as I got with that series, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just had kind of that general notion, and then 
you know, when I actually started studying it more, more seriously, it was, uh, you know, through hearing uh, some of the teaching from uh, Steve Gregg, who's in the film and, um, uh, and also reading his commentary, his, his commentary revelation uh, for views. I, I read through that commentary and it was really helpful to actually see all these different perspectives about the book of revelation in that sense. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and yeah, and probably about seven years after that is when I, uh, was introduced to uh, to folks like Douglas Wilson and and a few others and and her, you know I I I read his book Heaven Misplaced I I don't remember which came first totally either I read the book or I listened to a sermon series he had on post millennialism um, but yeah just a lot of those and he covers the same topics in the sermon series as in the book and so just a lot of those those subjects. Um, you know, really stood out to me and in, in, um, uh, in leading me to a post millennial perspective. And since I had already adopted a lot of the partial Frederick's interpretations, it wasn't that, you know, hard of a jump for me, I guess, that maybe yeah. for other people, it be a, a little more difficult, I guess. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's a little bit of my, my journey. <laughs> awesome. So since you've kind of had different views throughout, why does eschatology matter? And specifically having historical optimism be a part of your eschatology, what difference does it make? What are the, the consequences, I guess, of which you believe? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Actually, I, I still remember maybe about eight or nine years ago um, uh, talking to a friend who was a pastor who was a dispensationalist. And we were talking, you know, we were kind of debating back and forth about, you know, the book of Daniel. Or, or Daniel chapter nine or something. And, and I remember at one point of, of the discussion kind of saying, uh, or no, maybe it was about the, actually it was about the rapture. Now that I remember, oh, I, I was, I basically told him, well, you know, I'm a, a millennialist, you're a, you know, pre-millennialist. I mean, in the end, we both kind of believe that things are going to go from bad to worse. And, um, uh, and that ultimately there's going to be this you know, when, when right before Christ does come, things are going to get really bad. And I, so I said, ultimately, we don't have that different of a perspective. Now, at that point, I wasn't even, you know, close to being a post-millennialist. I hadn't even, I might have heard about it somewhere or, or something, but I, I, it wasn't even on my radar at that point. Um, and so, um, uh, but I, again, I think the, the issue boils down to um, the, this aspect of, of historical optimism. In other words, our expectation of the future is go, has to affect the way we live in the present. I mean, if we, we believe this world is just going to burn up and, or we believe that we're just going to disappear at any moment, you know, um, and, and everything's going to be left behind there, uh, that has to affect in some way or another how we are living our lives and, and how we see this, our, our role and our place in this world. You know, if we see ourselves as, you know, people on a sinking ship who are just trying to, you know, save a few people here and there before it completely goes down, uh, that's very different than a view of the kingdom of God invading this world, in a sense, and, 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 and filling this world with the glory of God. You know, I mean, that's, that's, those are two very different scenarios. And so I think um, his, this view of post-millennialism and historical optimism gives uh, people and, and has given me a, a hope for the future in terms of, of hoping for, praying for, working towards long-lasting impact on this world for the kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, considering and thinking about future generations, thinking about my children, thinking about, um, you know, what my work today might be doing for people that live 500 years from now or something like that. I mean, that's just something that in, in the normal or, or current evangelical um, world, that's just not something people think about all that much. And if they do think about it, they, they don't dare start thinking about eschatology at the same time, because that's just going to mess things up. Right. <laughs> right. And yes. so, so they kind of compartmentalize things and say, well, you know, I have my eschatology over here 
And, you know, these, these other issues are over on this side. And I don't want to, you know, if you bring them together, then you, you start to have, you know, serious problems in that sense. And so, yeah, I think, I, I think that's um, a very practical difference between post-millennialism and other views of eschatology is that historical optimism that leads to uh, very naturally for, to, to, uh, to people thinking about the future and working uh, and thinking that their work in this life and, and in this time the Lord has us on this planet actually can have an impact on future generations for the kingdom of God, ultimately. Right. Yeah, I love that. Um, but that does also kind of lead into another objection and probably too, because post-millennialism post isn't the widely held view, um, at least amongst most evangelicals, but people will look and say, but the world is so bad. Like men are so evil and we see so much sin. Like how could it possibly be that it's not going to get worse and worse? It's going to get better. Like we don't see that with our eyes. And it appears that the world is, you know, collapsing and the one world government is upon us and a new world order and all this kind of stuff that's being thrown, thrown around, talked about in almost every Christian circle. It's not just nine. I mean, Christians are discussing this as if it's, if it's as if it's the inevitable collapse of humanity is literally around the corner. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting, um, interesting kind of a objection that people raise because they usually raise it, you know, writing on their phones, you know, on their iPhones, uh, you know, living with all the marvels of, of modern technology that kings, you know, 800 years ago, you know, didn't have, right? And, and but, but we, you know, in our air conditioned homes, we still have the um, you know, we, we, we're, we're willing to say, oh, no, things right now are worse than they've ever been in all of human history. You know, Black Plague, nah, that, no big deal. We have COVID-19, you know. Um, oh, you just got our video banned. Thanks a lot, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. So, like um, Not COVID-19. We like what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so uh, uh Ultimately, I think that um, that yeah, we um, we have this a, a very limited historical perspective. Um, you know, we, we we are thinking that well, we're worse off now than people were twenty years ago, or or you know, and we don't see history. Uh, we don't have a long view of history, you know, because if we, if we took a, a, you know, more of a bird's eye view of history, we'd realize that, no, things have gotten a lot better, you know, in, in every measurable way, you know, in, in that sense. And, you know, speaking of life expectancy and a, a number of other issues, it's, it's not that hard to make the point that, no, actually, um, you know, you, you, you're better off now than if you were born in the 1500s, you know, just, you know, uh, it, you know, things like penicillin or sure. uh, you know, dentists. And uh, there, yeah. there's so many things that we take for granted that, and we, we just don't have a clear historical perspective. But now, you know, someone could say, well, those are all, um, and it, it, one could make that point very easily and they'll say, yeah, yeah, but those are, you know, kind of carnal, things, you know, the fact that you have an iPhone is not a spiritual advance, you know, and, and I, I would, I would beg to differ, but let's, okay, let's just say that's, that's so for a second. Um, what about the kingdom of God? And one point people have made to me before as well, no, you know, in, in Europe, you know, in the 1600s, you know, there's way more Christians, you know, people were, were way more Christian, but today, you know, things are, are not as Christian in Europe, for example. And I always say to people, okay, how many Christians were there in China in the 1600s? How many Christians were there in Africa? I mean, objectively speaking, there's just way more Christians alive today than there ever has been in the history of the world. I mean, that's, that's just a fact. And um, it, it, in that sense, Christianity has exploded across the globe. 
um, you know, on every continent and there, there's people that claim the name of Christ. And so, um, yeah, the, there are temporary setbacks. There are, you know, Europe, um, you know, has, has apostatized in a lot of ways. And, and, you know, those kind of things are part of, aren't foreign to the, the post-millennial perspective, you know, the idea that, yeah, there, we, we could fall under periods of judgments or particular parts of the globe might temporarily, you know, have some setbacks in terms of the advance of the gospel. But we have to remember that, you know, God's always working in that sense. And, and so just because I'm not seeing a great revival in my corner of the world right now does not mean that the, that the, the kingdom of God is not moving forward ultimately. And, um, I, and so we, we, we need to have a bit more of a, a, a bird's eye view of what's going on. And ultimately we need to trust in the promises of God. I mean, if God has promised to build his kingdom, if, 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 if it's God, you know, who's, who, who's building, you know, uh, then, then, um, uh, you know, if, what's, what's it? Psalm 127, you know, if, if, if the Lord does not build the house, you know, the builders uh, build in vain or something like that. Um, I mean, we have to trust that it's God who's working in this world. And that's why ultimately post-millennial, the, the, the proof of post-millennialism is not simply, oh, let's, let's look at the news and see what, what the latest thing that's going on. It's the promises of scripture. It's the fact that Christ has promised to build his kingdom and that, that we've been told in scripture that the, all, you know, all, all the, the nations of the world are going to be blessed, you know, and, and that future generations are going to come to, to Christ, you know, and that he's going to reign from, from sea to sea and from the rivers to the end of the earth. And so, um, you know, we have those promises in scripture and God is sovereign over history. And so he will fulfill those promises in his time, you know, and it's our job to just be faithful and, 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 you know, be a part of that work as God has called us in, in our small corner of the globe. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, it makes me think too, of the map that you show mm -hmm. in on earth yeah. as it is in heaven, where it kind of fast goes through and shows where the gospel, how it started, where it spread to, you see it grow in certain areas of the world and then shrink, but then it blows up somewhere else. So that's very much in line with um, the picture you just kind of gave us. It was a nice visual that goes with that whole idea of it is growing. And just because we're in a place in the world that we can't see that doesn't mean it's not growing in other places and it won't continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you this regarding, I actually want to ask you a question about Satan because this gets tossed around a lot. The God of this world, who is the God of this world? Is Satan still the God of this world? How much authority does Satan have in this world? Um, you know, I have Christian friends who will look at the technology and say, well, actually, this was started by Satanists and people that, I mean, I'm talking like technology, like our phones and the internet and stuff like that. I have Christians that push back on post mill eschatology and basically say, well, look, all of these things were essentially started because of the evil one was coming up with it was, you know, giving people ideas on how to create the internet. So, you know, all of these things. So I've had pushback on that kind of area, but what exactly is Satan's role now in this world? How should we as Christians understand Satan? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I mean, one of the emphases that a lot of people who reject the post-millennial view, um, you know, bring up is, well, Satan is the god of this world. You know, Satan is ruling over this world. And, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, that ultimately, no, Satan, you know, Christ is the king of kings and lord of lords. You know, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ is what we read in Matthew 28. And so there's a definitely a conflict there. If you think that, no, actually all authority, except the authority that's given to Satan has been given to Christ, <laughs> right. right? You know, that's, there's, there's a, there, there's a conflict right there, you know, um, Christ, you know, Satan offers Christ the nations. Um, and when he tempts him in the desert and Christ says, no, but 
Christ doesn't say no because he doesn't want the nations. He says no because he's going to get them anyways, ultimately. And, 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 and when it, Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, is given all authority on heaven and, and on earth. And so Satan um, is present in this world. He's, he's a, a defeated uh, king, a defeated prince. And, um, I, I, you know, even the passage that speaks of Satan as the God of this world, it's actually very interesting because that particular passage, a lot of, uh, you know, the, the early church fathers and other thought that the God of this world is actually talking about God, not Satan, you know, um, Augustine and others actually interpreted it as talking about God, the creator, you know, and not, um, as Satan, but, you know, be that as it may ultimately, um, you know, I, I know, for example, Greg Bonson in his book talks about the issue of, um, uh, of, of Satan being a, 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 a you know, ruler or, or of this world, not this world as in this planet, right? But this world as in, in an ethical sense, you know, as in the, those that reject and are in rebellion against God, that, that Satan rules over that group of people ultimately, but not over the planet. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and he, he, he uses the example also of, uh, I think it's in second Corinthians chapter seven, where, you know, it, it talks about repentance, uh, uh um, you know, a, a worldly, rep, uh, you know, worldly sorrow that leads to death, but godly repentance, you know, that leads to, to life. Right. And so Greg Bonson makes the point in, in his book, you know, basically saying, well, you know, obviously the, the, when it says, you know, the, the uh, you know, sorrow of this world, it's not talking about that. That's the only sorrow that exists on this planet. Right. It's talking about this world in an ethical sense, in terms of this, this world that rejects Christ and the, that lives according to that rebel and according, according to its rebellion, that world, you know, uh, is the one that Satan rules over, but not the planet mm -hmm. basically. So, so, uh, and so that's, I think, an interesting distinction mm -hmm. that, that needs to, to be made, you know, because Satan does not rule over the planet, you know, this is God's world, you know, and all authority, you know, Psalm chapter two, right? Ask of me and I'll give you the nations, the end of the earth as your possession so that the nations have been given to Christ. They don't belong to Satan, but Satan runs around and, you know, he's a, he's a, a defeated king you know defeated prince and he runs around and tries to start trouble and tries to uh impede the advance of the gospel but ultimately you know as we uh, he, he he's he's not able to ultimately the you know the the, the 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 gates of hades cannot resist the advance of the gospel in that sense and so that's uh i think what we we find what in in scripture at least in terms of who Satan is and, and what his role is today. That's good. That's good. Um, you have a follow-up to that? Um, no, I was going to move on to the documentary. Oh yeah, go ahead. So what compelled you to get started with the documentary um, talking about on earth as it is in heaven first and how long did it take you to prepare? That's a, that's a very good question. So um and I assume you didn't come up with a documentary on amillennialism or premillennialism, right? <laughs> like you, yeah, is this no. your first documentary. Yeah, this is, that was my first documentary. I mean, I, I only really, I actually didn't ever do any kind of photo or video stuff until about 2016 or something like that, 2015, 2016. Uh, my wife's a photographer, and so she always, you know, is into that but i've never really been been all that that interested or, or into uh, film but well it was know, done very well i just want to say aesthetically it was done very well for that to be your first one thank you thank yeah. you yeah and so i um let me see i um i think it was around 2018 i started i got the idea i think it was like march of 2018 um I started saying, well, you know, it would be interesting to do a documentary on this subject. And actually, but my, my goal was a bit more, um, was definitely a bit more modest in the sense that I, I was just thinking of doing a film here in Chile in Spanish 
because there, there weren't any books on post-millennialism here at the time in Spanish. Like there, there was only a few of David Chilton's books on PDF that, that, that were available, but, but there weren't any other books on post-millennialism basically um, at the time. And so I, am, uh, I said, well, this might be a good way to kind of introduce post-millennialism to the Spanish-speaking world. And I know a few pastors here that are post-mill, so I could, you know, look them up and interview them and just put something together. That was the, the original plan. And, um, uh, yeah, I went around. I did about five interviews. Uh, but being my first kind of attempt at a film... I made some pretty bad mistakes on all of the interviews. <laughs> and so, so I was going to have to reshoot all of that, basically. And um, uh, were they camera then, mistakes? Were they camera mistakes or what kind of what kind of errors were mistakes? Okay, so the first one was I went into, you know, we went into this one pastor's house and he I had lights, but they weren't daylight lights, you know, they they were the tungsten yeah and and then and he had his living room just these giant windows everywhere and there was no way i could block the light so i kind of and he was kind of short on time so I was just like oh, okay and i just set up and did it and the, the 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 skin tone of the lighting was just horrible it was just <laughs> like i tried a million ways moving it around and it was just not good um and then the second interview i went and did it we, you know we were at this church and the office was right next to the road and just all the traffic sound was just, it was just the worst time to do an interview. Uh, so the audio was terrible. And then just things like that, one after another, uh, at, that I was going to have to go back and just redo all those interviews. But then I had the opportunity. Um, so this was, yeah, like kind of the end of, end or, or mid 2018 and 2019. Uh, then I had the opportunity to go to the States and, um, uh, and while, you know, before I went to the States, I, I said, well, maybe I could get a few interviews in English, you know, and uh, since I'm up there, you know, we, we knew, I knew Steve Gregg and he was kind of about, you know, in California, about 45 minutes from where I was going to be staying. So I, you know, contacted him. And then, um, you know, I, I also contacted um, uh, Pastor Douglas Wilson and, um, uh, and, and so, you know, was able to, to get a, well, cause my, that was the other thing is my, my sister-in-law and her family, they, they live in, um, in Washington state. Mm. And so we were going to be in California and then go up and visit them at the end of our trip for like two, two or three weeks. And then I, I started to think like, well, how far is Washington from Idaho? And then I just Googled, Googled that. And I'm like, wow, that's not that far. Maybe I should try and, you know, and, and, and so I, I was able to get an interview with, with Pastor Doug Wilson. And um, I also got an interview, uh, looked up uh, Bruce Gore, mm. who at the time, I, I actually didn't know a lot about Bruce Gore. I was literally just looking for people who kind of were in the same geographical area that I was going to be in. And I saw that, that yeah, he was, he lived in Washington and, and I'd heard some classes just like, like two or three classes of his. And I was like, yeah, those, those they're really good. And so I, I contacted him and, um, uh, and yeah, that's kind of how it, it came together. And then, yeah, with the, with Ken Gentry, I, I wasn't able to travel out to, um, uh, interview him but a, another friend of his a, a brother who's also a filmmaker um actually w did the interviews for me and um, i just sent him the questions oh, so <laughs> yeah yeah so then I, I i i came back to chile and i had all these four you know like four interviews basically and you know i was going to have to redo these other interviews and do it half in english half in spanish and and then we had this whole social upheaval here in Chile that was in October of 2019. And that just shut down. Like you couldn't travel, you couldn't go anywhere. And, and so then it was just like, yeah, no, I'm just going to work with, with these. I'm just going to do it. Now it's going to all be in English. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's funny because I was actually looking at it today because one of the projects that I'm working on is to do the, the, the original film with voiceovers in Spanish. Mm. And so 
And I'm, I, I was opening the project today and I still have all my voiceovers in Spanish from, you know, cause I originally did all the voiceovers. I was making the film in Spanish and then switched it up and, and did them all in English basically. Wow. <laughs> so, so yeah. And, and, and the project, um, I, I, you know, I published the, the, the film on February. Well, I finished it, you know, finally. And then I was like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> I didn't really know what, <clears throat> what to do. And I just, well, I guess I'll just put it on YouTube and Facebook. And that's what I did. And um, uh, yeah, that was February 15th, like a little less than a month <clears throat> before February 15th, 2020. So a little less than a month before the world just went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of a, a lot of people say kind of a strange year to launch a film about post-colonialism, but you know, uh, it, hey, it, it, was, and, it, it was, it was the year we went post mill and that's, yeah, yeah that's, that, it's all crazy. It was <laughs> yeah. a wonderful year. It was a great year for us. Post mill. I mean, yeah, honestly. Yeah. It's funny. I, I do wonder, you know, I mean, I, I think in the Providence, obviously in the Providence of God, you know, the timing and everything. I do wonder if, what if I would have launched that film in just like some other random year, like 2016 or something. Right. Yeah. But it just, you know, I, it, it's very interesting how it all came about in such a crazy time, you know? And I had obviously no way of knowing that, a, you know, a <laughs> month later, there's the world's just going to be locked down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically. And, and if people, are, I guess, are going to be home and Wanting to watch movies about eschatology, I guess. Right, so. exactly. What's going to happen in the end times? Oh, it's optimistic. What do you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. So what was the reception initially? Did it blow up on YouTube and Facebook? Did you immediately start getting response? Has, is, it a, is it a slow growth, kind of like the kingdom and, and post-millennialism? Or what has been the response thus far? Or at least right Well, it, it's, yeah. I mean, I think in the beginning, it, it, it was pretty slow um i mean obviously just my friends and people who know me you know saw it and and shared it a bit and and things like that and um uh but yeah i think over this last year is when you know things have really um you know kind of it's it's gained a lot of of momentum you know um you know i mean i think i had about you know, after about a little more than a, um, maybe a year or so, I had about, you know, 20,000 views or something on, um, on YouTube or, or something like that. And that actually was very interesting because, uh, you know, Dr. James White actually uh, did a sermon a while back where he kind of, um, ex, you know, made a defense of postmillennialism and kind of told everybody that he is now a postmillennialist. Right. And in that sermon at the end, he mentioned my movie. We, and so, yeah, yeah, we saw that. We saw that. <laughs> we saw that. Yeah, and, I, and so that I was really flat. crazy <laughs> because all of a sudden I, I had, I like, I had way more views than I normally have. You know, <laughs> right. That apology like, at church, man, they're pretty big. They have a pretty big. Yeah. Range. Yeah. And so that was, that was really cool. Um, and you know, that gained a lot of, of momentum from that point, I guess. And I, and, but it's been slow. I mean, and, and, but it's been, been very interesting because again, I didn't really know what I expected it to be, you know, I mean, it, it's just something I just felt really compelled to make. As I said, it was just originally supposed to be in Spanish, but then I said, well, I, I guess I can speak English and everybody's speaking English. Might as well just do it in English. Uh, but <laughs> But I didn't really figure that it was going to be something that went beyond maybe this, my circle here, you know, in South America, but it definitely has. And that's, that's been, you know, pretty, pretty amazing in that sense. Yeah. So, so again, it's been slow. It's, 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 it, it but it's, it's been very, um, it, it's been very encouraging to hear the feedback from a lot of folks that, you know, even though it's not a you know, millions of people, it's, it's a group of people that have been really encouraged by it, you know, yeah. um, and, 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 and a lot of people that have actually, you know, changed their opinions about eschatology. So, so to me, all of that is very, uh, very encouraging, you know, and, and, and very exciting that a project that, um, you know, again, just starting out in this whole thing of, of making films was able to, uh, you know, 
be an encouragement for a lot of people ultimately. Absolutely. Yeah. I hope you get to make it in Spanish too, but I'm really <laughs> glad you had to make it in English first, or we wouldn't have been able to watch it and understand anything. Um, so that that's awesome. Um, did you have a favorite interview? Someone's interview that you liked the most, or you enjoyed talking with them the most? Um, well, I mean, out of, out of the first film or all the films or, or the new project I'm working on or. Well, you could do the first film. Let's do on earth as it is in heaven and break that down. We're not asking you for a favorite, obviously. I mean, there those guys are all great. So we're not asking for a favorite person, but just maybe interview or something that stood out or was, you know, caught you off guard or some, you know, what, something to that nature. Well, I mean, it was, I think all of, cause there was basically three interviews that I, that I did, you know, right with, with, um, um, with, with Steve Gregg. And I, you know, my, I, I've known Steve uh, for, for a number of years. So, so it was great to, you know, go over and, and do the interview. And I, I, I listened to a lot of what he's, he said. So I kind of knew most of what he was going to say. And, and that was, that was really, really cool to, to be able to have that interview with him. Um, with, you know, with, with, with Pastor Doug Wilson, it was just the whole experience was really cool because I went out to, uh, to Moscow, Idaho and got to meet a lot of the folks over there. And, um, uh, and yeah, and, and um, got to meet, you know, Darren Doan, who's, who's a filmmaker who lives out there. And uh, that was really cool. Um, and yeah, just, just that, that, that was a, a pretty awesome experience in general, just to see everything that those guys are doing over there. Um, and, 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 um, and, and yeah, seeing all that was, was, uh, was cool. And then, yeah, meeting, uh, Bruce Gore was, was also great. You know, and I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I, I went through, from Moscow and, and drove up to Spokane and, and did this interview and then kept driving back to uh, Bellingham where, where we were staying in Washington there. Um, but yeah, no, me meeting uh, Bruce Gore was also, uh, he was a really nice guy. Um, he prayed for me before we, before I left on my trip, it was just really, it was a really cool interview. And so for me, each one of those steps in that, process was 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 just yeah it, it was just amazing I mean it's just to me that that and all everything that's happened after that it's just been amazing to have the opportunity to sit down and ask questions of all these uh, these guys that I've you know read their books or or listened to their sermons and um, uh, and 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 yeah actually getting to do that was was pretty pretty amazing yeah yeah um, now you For based sure. a lot of the um, a lot of the initial documentary on Ian Murray's book, is that right? The Puritan Hope, or at least there was a yes. lot of information derived from the Puritan Hope, correct? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Good book. Yeah. No, that's a great. I think that's a great book that brings that historical aspect to it too, because um, yeah, that that's a re really important point. I think that is often overlooked because. Since we we a lot of times don't look at these things all that historically, um, people think that you know um, that that post millennialism is some kind of a new fangled thing that you know that's coming out of the woodwork uh, these days. You got you got to be careful about those those crazy old post millennialists <laughs> that are popping up everywhere. You know, kind of yeah. a attitude. But really, I mean, when you go back, you know, a few hundred years you know, most people were post-millennialists. Right. And, and most of the people that you would recognize their names, you know, uh, for one reason or another were post-millennialists. And so I, I think that whole part of the story needed to be told, you know, yeah. um, just because it, it challenges the paradigm of a lot of, because a lot of people, you know, are just under the impression that every all Christ, you know, that Martin Luther and all these different Christians just believed in the rapture, you know, because right. of course everybody believes in the rapture <laughs> or something like that, you know? And, um, but that's why it's, it's also interesting to see like, no, actually all these people that you, we look back on, you know, people like George Whitfield or Jonathan Edwards or, 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 or those kinds of folks um, were actually post-millennialists, you know? And even guys like, you know, John Wesley or, you know, 
even even guys like Charles Finney, you know, who I'm not a huge fan of, but he he was actually a, a, a post millennialist. So it's it's yeah. pretty interesting to to think about that and and to factor in what that view, um, the effect that view had on on their thinking, on their ministries. And, um, and I, I think we, we don't properly understand that period and, and those, uh, those preachers and those people without considering the aspect of eschatology as well. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think, I think that that's why the, I think Ian Murray's book is so helpful in that sense, because it just, it brings up a lot of those issues. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. And I would also include uh, early church fathers. You know, I was reading quotes by Origen. Athanasius, Augustine, these guys, they may not have been, they may not have called themselves post-millennialists, but they had an optimistic viewpoint of history that in space-time, Christ would triumph over his enemies and that the gospel would be victorious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely, I I think we could at least say that this idea of, of historical optimism has been an element that's been present throughout you know, church history. And I mean, obviously a lot of these guys, you know, that you, you, you read one thing about them and then another thing you're like, oh, I don't know how optimistic <laughs> that is. And, yeah. you know, so, so it, I think it's a, it, it's a mixed bag through history in some ways, but there is that element, you know, when you read Athanasius or, you know, read these, there is that element of, um, uh, of historical optimism present a lot, a lot of times, you know, and, and, and yeah, just so many things that we, uh, in our current, you know, pro- postmodern culture um, have just have lost in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've been going for a while now. Let me ask you about Teach All Nations. So you've got the first part. I've seen the first uh, the first part to that. I've I've seen that one a handful of times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm anxiously awaiting at least part two. So when's it coming out? Yeah, well, the 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 part one is actually not out yet. That was a that oh. was a secret secret re- release that I did a while back. It's actually going to be uh, um, hopefully coming out not in the too distant future. I'm, I'm working right now with Lore TV, which is a new platform that's coming out, and so um, you know they 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 still haven't launched that. And so uh, when they do launch, you know that sh- the the first episode. Uh, most likely will 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 be there, um, and yeah, and then I'm I'm working on on funding the other episodes as well through Lore. Do we know uh, how many in particular? Do we know how many episodes there might be? Well, I'm I'm aiming for five, you know. Okay. So uh, so that's that's what I, I I set out to. So hopefully I have enough uh, material for that. Um, yeah, but that but, means um, there'll uh, be ten. If you're, <laughs> if you're aiming for five, there's going to be at least ten. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's a it's a new challenge, definitely for me because um, it's not as easy making four or five episodes is not as easy as making a movie, definitely. Yeah. Because a movie you have a beginning, an end, and a middle, right? Mm-hmm. And and uh, every episode is a little movie, you know. So you have to have a beginning, an end, and a middle for for every episode, which is is a, a greater challenge. And uh, and yeah, I'm still. Still trying to navigate that, still figuring that out. So I got the first episode kind of done and working on on the others right now. I also have a lot more material to work with because, as I said, the first um, film I I did four in I had four interviews. Right, this one I think I have fourteen interviews wow. right now. So, wow. Uh, so yeah, a lot of interviews, a lot of material. Um, some of them are shorter. I mean, the, the, the one thing with the, the interviews I, I had uh, in the first film is all the interviews are, were like over an hour long, you know, mm-hmm. the ones that I, I did. Um, but these, there's some that are 30 minutes, some that are an hour. They're, they're, they're usually a bit shorter than, than the other ones. But still, uh, there's a lot of more material to work through and figure out how it's like a puzzle, just figuring out how it all fits together. Does this piece fit here? No, it doesn't. And, and then just switching things around. It's, it's a, it's a bit of a process for sure. Yeah. Can people, I, I saw at one point you had on your website, people can donate to, for this particular film project. Is that, is that still there? Can people still donate for, to, to this project? Well, no, no right now it's it, because it's going to be um, that, that was, you know, before I had the whole, deal with lore 
set up. But now what, what it, what's going to happen is it's going to go through um, Lore, basically. And, they're, they're, and Lore is kind of a crowdfunding, a mixture between a crowdfunding platform and a, um, uh, um, you know, like a streaming service, you know, like a Netflix kind of a thing. Okay. And so, yeah, one, one thing that's, that's, you know, I've been thinking about a lot with this latest film and trying to navigate is, you know, you know, obviously part is just the financial thing to be able to, to fundraise, to, to, to keep making these kind of things. Uh, but the other is, you know, actually the plat, you know, thinking about the platforms that I'm using and all that, because, you know, we're living in some pretty strange times. Uh, and it's very easy to build up a, a platform on YouTube or this or that, and then just have the, uh, that taken away in a day because you, you use the wrong word or, or exactly. whatever. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so, um, so yeah, that's something I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons also I wanted to go with, with, with lore, um, and in that sense is, you know, actually being a part of, of platforms that are, uh, I, I guess, going in the wrong, uh, in the right direction in that sense. Absolutely. And not just building on, on a platform that's ultimately just going to be swept out. I mean, even when I uploaded that episode um, to YouTube that, that, um, uh, that, that you saw and, you know, shared it for a few days with people, um, immediately YouTube put a restriction on it, like, Wow. Like it was sensitive content. So um, <laughs> interesting. So yeah. So even so that's that was one thing where it was like, yeah, I don't I don't know how well that's gonna go. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and so so yeah, that so, so that's a little bit of a in terms of the, the platform. Um it's it, I'm I'm hoping that lore is gonna be launching in the in the near near future, right? And hopefully. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more news before the end of the year for sure um, in terms of that but um, but yeah that's going to be the 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 way that this new movie is going to be uh, or new docuseries sorry good well I'm highly Same anticipating that <laughs> I'm highly <laughs> anticipating this so good happy to know we may hear something before the end of the year did you have any follow-up question um, do you have a next project in mind? I know this is still a pretty big one that you have lots of episodes left on, but do you have anything that you're pondering past that? Well, right now I just have to finish this one. I mean, I'm, I'm about, I'm only about 30% done with it. So I, there, I still have a lot of, I mean, well, I guess in terms of editing and putting, I mean, I guess I'm, I've done a lot, I've done the interviews, you know, I'm a, I'm a good way ahead with that but just putting everything together which is sometimes the hardest it's the hardest part you know um that's i still have a lot of work in that so i haven't really i mean i do want to do future projects for sure and you know have a few vague ideas but nothing totally totally concrete i want to finish this and see if i i mean yeah i'd love to be able to continue making these kinds of films and um, uh, and yeah get, just keep going down that rabbit trail ultimately encouraging people in in this whole issue of, of post-millennialism and the the new series that teach all nations it's not so much about the book of revelation or about you know the details of eschatology it's about the practical application it's about like okay well if we're if the rapture isn't coming anytime soon if we're we're going to be around here for a while what what changes should I see should I do in my life I mean what what does that look like what how should I be um, uh, thinking about my life and my calling and my family and all these things you know and so that's more the focus of of this series so it's a lot of practical Christian worldview um, kind of, of stuff as well I guess yeah that is awesome. wonderful such a great endeavor thanks well, thank you so much for being on with us, Nathan. It's a yes, pleasure. Thank you. We will uh, we will, we will share the documentary if it's all right with you underneath our link or description so people can check it out. If that's awesome. good with you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for the, the invitation. It's been Absolutely. great to have this chat with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful. For sure. Thank you for listening to the Love of Life podcast, Conversations with Jesse and Courtney.
it is our duty through our schools to create a new one, a God-centered one. We are told in Proverbs 8, verses 35 and 36, For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death.